uh, webinar with the Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan. Um, my name is Tara Mulhern Davidson. I'm the interim manager for the um, Prairie Conservation Action Plan, and this is our February Prairie Speaker Series. Uh, so we host 12 different Native Prairie Speaker Series throughout the year. Uh, some of them are in person, and a couple of them have been webinars. So this is actually our second webinar that we're hosting. Uh, we're very excited to have over 70 people registered for this webinar. So uh, thank you all very much for registering. We really appreciate your interest, and um, we look forward to just sharing some information with everyone. So our topics are usually about species at risk and prairie conservation uh, in general. So um, this topic today is the greater sage growth um, and we've welcomed Kelsey Malloy from the NRCS, uh, Montana Association of Conservation Districts, uh, to discuss the greater sage growth conservation efforts in the U.S. and the sage growth initiative. Um, so webinars are kind of a good way to, uh, to broaden our scope and our audience and also our speakers so we're able to uh, draw speakers from other areas that we wouldn't otherwise normally be able to uh, due to travel and costs and things like that. So uh, we're very pleased to, uh, to be having uh, Kelsey here on the line. Um, so before I introduce Kelsey, um, I would like to uh, just mention again that we will be putting this presentation up on our YouTube channel. So you can access that by visiting our website at www.pcap-sk.org. And then at the very bottom, there's a link to our YouTube channel as well as our other social media platforms. And we also have another upcoming uh, speaker series on March the 5th. So that'll be an in-person speaker series at Beachy, Saskatchewan, at the New Horizons Senior Center from 1 p.m. until 2.30 p.m. and discuss uh, there will be grassland uh, BMPs, or grassland beneficial management practices. So um, with that, I think I'd like to, uh, to introduce Kelsey, and we can get underway with our, uh, with our webinar. Um, if you do have questions at any time, um, please feel free to send me a quick chat, and that should be available on the left-hand side of your screen in the webinar window, um, you or sorry, the right-hand side. Uh, you should be able to find a little uh, plus sign beside chat, and you can send me a question. Uh, and I can, uh, I can moderate the questions at the end of the presentation. And um, I would like to just mention that in-kind support for this speaker series is provided by the Montana Association of Conservation Districts and the Sage Growth uh, Initiative. And this project was undertaken with the financial support of the Government of Canada through the Federal Department of the Environment. So Kelsey Malloy is a range and wildlife conservationist with the Montana Association of Conservation Districts in partnership with the Natural Resources Conservation Services. She did her master's research through the University of Manitoba on cattle stalking rates and grassland songbirds in the Grasslands National Park in Saskatchewan. So Kelsey is certainly no stranger to Saskatchewan rangelands at all. Uh, so she's particularly passionate about collaborating on wildlife conservation on working ranch, rangelands. So please join me in welcoming uh, Kelsey to start off our presentation. Hi Tara, can you hear me? Yes, you bet Kelsey, I sure can. Excellent. I lost you there for a minute, I was a little worried. <laughs> Alright, so thanks for the introduction Tara. Um, as she mentioned, I'm going to be talking about uh, greater sage grass conservation in the US and a specific program we have called the Sage Grass Initiative. Um, I wanted to get involved with the Sage Grass Initiative because I really liked their focus on proactive conservation and that they were working with landowners to implement conservation. So I'm just going to um, start off with a little bit of background about the sage grouse in case um, anyone's not familiar with them. And then I will move on to talking about some of the threats that they're facing here, some of the conservation efforts that are in place, and finish up by talking about the sage grouse initiative specifically. So greater sage grouse are um, a bird about the size of a chicken, and we consider them, so, them to be a, a landscape species. They're found in large areas of intact sagebrush, and they respond to changes that occur at the landscape level. Um, some populations of the bird are migratory, so they're on a life cycle in the early spring, the males gather at what are known as leks. There are these dancing grounds where the males display. Most, um, a majority of nests are then within about three to four miles of that lek, that key area. 
However, uh, in the summer, as things get drier, some populations will move to uh, wetland areas, riparian areas, or move further up mountains in order to find areas that are green. So some of them migrate then. Additionally, in the winter, they require a, a thicker cover of sagebrush. And some populations, like the uh, Canadian population in Saskatchewan, will migrate further south to find areas that have um, heavier big sagebrush cover. So for their diet, they rely on uh, sage leaves in the winter. That's about all they eat. Uh, forbs, which are wildflowers, green growth, and insects during the um, uh, chick rearing stage. Wetlands are crucially important for this bird, even though they make up uh, just a small part of the landscape in the West. Um, because in that uh, period of time when the chicks are being raised at the end of the summer, that's where most of their food sources are. Uh, another thing to point out about wetlands is that although a majority of the sage grouse range is on public lands in the US, a majority of the, these key wetland areas are actually on private lands. And we often consider greater sage grouse to be an umbrella species for the entire sagebrush ecosystem that is facing challenges. So across the West over the last few decades, there's been lots of degradation of sagebrush ecosystem due to uh, agricultural conversion, development, uh, putting roads and power lines and things like that. And so a number of the efforts that are taking place to benefit sage grouse can have benefits for other species as well. For example, um, a recent study found that in Wyoming, conservation efforts that were aimed at helping sage grouse, uh, such as conservation, conservation easements and the Wyoming core area policy, uh, also benefited mule deer wintering range and migration areas. Um, and additionally, areas that are conserved for sage grouse um, can provide habitat for species like you see at the bottom, the sagebrush lizard, pygmy rabbit, and sagebrush sparrow, along with about 300 other sagebrush obligate species. There was also a recent study finding that sagebrush lands in the western US uh, on public land generate over $600 million in economic benefits from recreational visitors, hunters, bird watchers, things like that. So all these actions that are being taken to um, help sage grouse populations can have kind of trickle-down effects in other areas as well. So currently, um, sage grouse are found in 11 western states and two Canadian provinces. Um, however, they've been extirpated from about half of their former range. They actually used to have a small population in British Columbia as well. And the current population is estimated to be a quarter to a half a million birds, compared to previous estimates that were in the millions of birds. Uh, one interesting thing with sage grouse is that although their range is uh, fairly wide and there's a large area that's considered sage grouse habitat, uh, their populations are concentrated in um, areas that are especially good habitat. So these uh, red, oranges, and yellow dots on the screen show where the populations are concentrated. And it turns out that about 75% of the sage grouse population is located in um, about one quarter of the habitat. So a lot of conservation efforts have been focused on these, uh, these areas with the highest concentrations of birds, which are called the core areas. And by focusing efforts in these areas, um, you can benefit three times as many birds as you could by putting money outside of those core areas. So for example, in Montana, which is where I am, um, these yellow areas on the map are our core areas. But the gray, which is much larger, shows all of our uh, general habitat. Um, the core areas are usually based on lek locations. However, in Montana, we also have this uh, connectivity area. And that was put in place um, to benefit the birds that are migrating from Saskatchewan south into Montana for the winter. So as many of you may know, in Canada, 
uh, sage grouse are listed as endangered under the Species at Risk Act. In the U.S., uh, sage grouse are not listed yet. They are a candidate species under the Endangered Species Act. So a candidate species means that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service decided that the bird was warranted for listing. However, there were other species that were more of a priority, and so they said that they would not list them right away. So in 2010, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service declared greater sage grouse as a candidate species. They were then taken to court by some groups that felt like um, the bird needed to be listed sooner, uh, otherwise it would face further declines. So uh, a court ruling came down that said that the Fish and Wildlife Service had to make a decision as to whether or not to list the bird as threatened, endangered, or not at all by September of 2015, which is fast approaching. So that's for the greater sage grouse, the overall population. We also have uh, what are considered two distinct population segments, which means that they're uh, genetically isolated enough from the other population that uh, they will be considered separately for listing decisions. Uh, there's also a bird called the Gunnison sage grouse, which is found in Colorado and Utah. And this bird uh, is very closely related to sage grouse, and but, sorry, the greater sage grouse. And um, they were just listed as threatened in November. And it's already proved to be highly contentious. Um, both environmental groups in the state of Colorado are suing the Fish and Wildlife Service. So it's kind of um, a good warning for people involved with greater sage grouse of how contentious it could end up being, although they are separate species, and so some factors are different there. Oops. Sorry, guys. So when the Fish and Wildlife Service um, declared the bird as a candidate species, two of the major threats that they saw were threats to the sagebrush ecosystem through loss and degradation of habitat, and additionally a lack of regulatory mechanism, meaning that there weren't enough um, solid regulations in place to prevent uh, loss of habitat or harm to the bird's population. So um, one of the uh, threats that ties into the habitat has been um, various types of development in the West and the uh, fragmentation that goes along with that. Um, energy development and uh, suburban development often result in increased roads, uh, health structures like power lines, and sage grouse are very sensitive to disturbance like that and will avoid those structures. Or um, So, so that's one of the threats that they're facing. Another issue, uh, especially in areas like Idaho and Nevada, has been loss of habitat to wildfires. Sagebrush, um, big sagebrush ecosystems, which is uh, very different than the silver sage you see in Canada sometimes, um, is very sensitive to fire and it can take 80 to 100 years for the habitat to recover. Um, the fire uh, acres being burned have increased uh, in the last few decades. And as you can see from the map here, uh, this has especially been a problem in Idaho and Nevada. And so a lot of the um, core sage grouse habitat there has been lost to these fires. And that fire cycle has been amplified by uh, cheatgrass, which is an invasive species um, that moves in and provides a fuel base for fires. And so these sagebrush ecosystems are then essentially replaced by cheatgrass after the fire, and um, it's just a complete loss of habitat there. This map shows uh, Montana, the Dakotas, and Wyoming. And so in this area, a lot of area uh, habitat has already been converted to cropland but especially on the edges of um, that management zone, 
there's still a high risk in some areas for additional conversion of habitat to cropland. Um, some other threats are conifer encroachment, uh, especially as you move off of the Great Plains. Junipers and pinion pines, things like that, will move into a sagebrush ecosystem and eventually uh, take over the entire ecosystem. So you can see from uh, these photos at the bottom, this is what we call phase one juniper encroachment. So you're just starting to get a few trees coming in. Phase two, you have a significant amount more of cover. And then by phase three, there's essentially no uh, sagebrush left. And so as little as a 4% conifer cover can be enough to uh, lose sage grass in the area. Uh, additionally, uh, other types of development or habitat degradation, West Nile virus can be an issue for the birds as sage grass have essentially no immunity to the virus and it's um, not native to North America. And changes in habitat have also led to a changing predator community. Birds like ravens will um, have spread significantly with uh, expansion of power lines, landfills, tall structures. So across the US, as people are starting to think about the potential implications of a listing, a lot of different um, agencies at the federal, state, and local level have started um, working to incorporate sage grouse uh, concerns into their, their planning and regulations. So the Department of Interior, which is um, a department that includes things like the Bureau of Land Management, the National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, recently said that they were going to uh, include sage grouse habitat needs in their um, wildfire responses to try and avoid losing some of those uh, those important big sagebrush ecosystems um, rather than trying to rehabilitate them after a fire. So they're incorporating uh, that into their threat response. The US Forest Service, uh, about, I believe about 8% of their land is sage grouse habitat in the West. And so they're amending uh, 21 of their national forest plans to incorporate sage grouse needs um, and adjusting uh, things like grazing practices or energy development accordingly. The Bureau of Land Management is um, uh, manages millions of acres of public land in the West. A lot of it um, is used for multi multiple purposes like uh, recreation, grazing, and energy development or mining. And so the Bureau of Land Management has been working on revising their regional management plans in all of the areas that have sage grouse uh, to also incorporate um, sage grouse needs into their plants. And so that's been a multi-year process that they've been working on these, um, and they're starting to come out with some of those now. Since the bird is currently not uh, listed, their uh, management is currently run by the state wildlife agencies in each individual state that has the bird. And these agencies monitor populations through uh, lek counts, brood counts, and information gathered from hunters. And they also uh, regulate the hunting that's allowed. So in 10 of the 11 states where they're found, hunting is legal. Um, seven of these had a season in 2013, and I think probably less than 2014. Um, Montana has consistently had some of the uh, longest and most liberal hunting seasons. Um, last year, it was uh, the season was uh, cut in half to one month, and uh, hunting was closed in a number of the counties where they felt that the sage grouse population was not stable. Currently, in our state legislature here, uh, there's a bill being uh, brought up that would close sage grouse hunting for six years. So. Um, We'll see if that goes through. Uh, a number of the states also have some sort of plan or program in place to address sage grouse needs. 
um, Idaho, Nevada, Wyoming, Montana, uh, all have some sort of plan in place. Uh, Idaho has a Office of Species Concern out of the governor's office, and they um, put a plan in place actually in 1997. Um, and some other states are, are uh, just starting to do that now, like Montana. Um, in Montana, uh, there's a bill in the legislature that would fund a $10 million stewardship fund, which would provide um, money for habitat uh, enhancement and easement. Um, additionally, some of these plans, like the Wyoming and Montana plan, include buffers around the LEX in the core area. Uh, this core area policy means that um, development is limited in those areas to avoid um, harming the breeding population. Uh, in Nevada, they have a sagebrush ecosystem program that uh, is also out of the governor's office. And in addition to some of the uh, other aspects of the plan, they have a conservation credit system in place where uh, actions taken to improve or create new sagegrass habitat are entered into the system. And then uh, anyone who is going to end up uh, disturbing or harming sage fresh habitat would have to buy some of those credits. And Montana is looking at a similar mitigation strategy. Um, it's important to mention with these state plans that in a number of the state's local working groups have been uh, involved with those. These are community groups where different stakeholders can come together and discuss issues. And um, a number of them have worked on improvement projects for sage grouse habitat. In Idaho, there are 13 different uh, sage grouse local working groups for each area that has sage grouse. And they are um, basically implementing the state plan at a local level. So there's all different levels of involvement here. And what we're seeing with the state plans and the federal efforts is that those are trying to address the um, lack of regulatory mechanism that the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, was worried about. So they're trying to put in place uh, policies and regulations um, that will permanently uh, avoid disturbance and destruction of St. Charles habitat, especially in those core areas. Uh, a few other things to mention are um, in both Oregon and Wyoming, some groups have worked with the Fish and Wildlife Service to create candidate conservation agreements with assurances. So these agreements are um, allow landowners to put conservation measures in place to address sage grouse threats. Um, and they work with the Fish and Wildlife Service on this. And then if the bird is listed, they have legal assurances from the service that they won't be required to do any additional actions in the case of a listing, um, and that they will be allowed incidental take, meaning if they were to accidentally harm a bird or habitat, they um, would not be liable for that. Universities in the West have also played an important role in working on research to uh, better our understanding of the birds, especially with regards to management actions. So there's been research on um, the importance of connectivity in their habitat. Um, there's ongoing research on uh, grazing and interactions with grazing and habitat, and uh, other research on the effectiveness of predator control. So all the research that's been coming out has been really helpful for managers in, design, in designing uh, scientifically sound management. So now I'm going to uh, switch to talking about the Sage Grass Initiative. And so in order to talk about the Sage Grass Initiative, I have to tell you what the Natural Resources Conservation Service is. Um, if you're in the US, you might be more familiar uh, with this. It's a branch of the US Department of Agriculture. And we were formed in response to the Dust Bowl, or the Dirty Thirties. And we were originally called the Soil Conservation Service, and we worked with farmers on improving um, uh, improved farm practices to decrease soil erosion. Now, 
um, we administer some of the farm programs that are aimed at improving uh, natural resource concerns while also benefiting agricultural producers. All our programs are voluntary in that landowners can come to us um, with concerns that they have and we'll work with them. However, if you enter into a contract with us, then they're um, legally obligated to follow through with that contract. And we provide cost sharing for uh, some of our practices. So the Sage Grouse Initiative is a special program within the Natural Resources Conservation Service, but it's in partnership with a number of other groups who have provided um, funding staff and other um, benefits. So for example, my position, which is under the Sage Grouse Initiative, um, I'm actually employed by the Montana Association of Conservation Districts, but I receive additional funding for my position from groups like Pheasants Forever, Conoco Phillips, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, Intermountain West Joint Venture. So the NRCS's focus has always been on uh, private lands. And as I mentioned earlier, um, that those wetlands for sage grouse um, are often found on private lands, even though uh, a federal agency might own most of the surrounding land. And so it is really important for sage grouse that um, when they're leaving the nesting area and going to raise their chicks, they're often moving onto private lands. And we are able to work with private landowners in a way that some of the other um, public land agencies aren't able to. So we use Farm Bill funding, and we've been trying to implement what we're doing in strategic areas. So we have 20 positions, 27 positions across the western states that are just focused on this program. And they're all um, in small rural communities. So we get to work with landowners every day in the core habitat. And the goal is to benefit populations enough to prevent listings. And then we also are involved with um, scientific studies to make sure that our practices are effective. And so this is a map showing where um, the Sage Grass Initiative positions are. Um, and you can see that they're scattered across the West um, in these small Western towns. So the Sage Grouse Initiative is trying to take a different approach to conservation in that we're working proactively before a species is listed to improve their habitat. We're working with a number of other uh, partners, including other agencies, to kind of reach outside our, our traditional bounds. Um, we're focusing our efforts in the areas where we'll get the most uh, conservation benefits for our dollar. It involves a lot of planning, and we use the best science and um, management tools that we have available. And we always try and um, monitoring is a key part of our plans, and um, we're using ongoing research to adjust what we're doing. So our three key goals are to remove that to sage grouse while also improving the um, long-term sustainability of working ranches. We want to see these remain on the landscape. We want to implement enough of the right practices so that um, we're seeing benefits to the populations of sage grass, not just the individual level. And then to do that follow-up and see how effective it is what we're doing, quantify that, and um, share that with the rest of the world. So we're operating under this uh, paradigm that good rangeland management can also benefit sage grouse. Um, things like controlling weeds, um, having healthy grasses, these are things that can benefit um, wildlife and are also beneficial to maintaining ranching. We figure that uh, having working ranches intact means that we also have intact wildlife habitat. 
So in 2010, after the sage grouse were considered um, a candidate species, the Natural Resources Conservation Service met with the Fish and Wildlife Service and um, created what's called a conference report. So we went through a number of the conservation practices that a producer um, can use through us and made sure that um, Fish and Wildlife Service was OK with them, that those practices would either benefit sage grouse or not harm them. So now if a landowner works with us, they have um, predictability on those practices. So for example, if someone were to put in a grazing management plan with us, and then the bird was listed, they would have uh, some legal assurance that their grazing management plan was OK by Fish and Wildlife Service, as long as they continued following our um, NRCS standards. And this helps ensure that the voluntary efforts that producers are taking um, will be counted when the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, goes to make their decision on whether or not to list the bird. So when a producer comes to us and is interested in working on sage grouse habitat or really any issue, they, uh, we have a process that we go through. So they would submit an application with us and also tell us what their concerns were, the uh, issues that they felt they had that they wanted to address, like a lack of water on their ranch or something like that. We would then go do an inventory on their ranch and um, figure out things like how much uh, production they have, how many um, uh, cows they can have without causing uh, range health issues. We would also um, go through a checklist of threats for sage grouse. Um, so we try and identify um, any problems on the ranch that could be causing issues for sage grouse. And then we would try and address those in our conservation plan. So after we identify our resource concerns, um, we would come up with some possible alternatives to address that and working with the producer, figure out what works best for them, and turn it into a conservation plan. We would then um, put the application through our ranking process uh, for sage grouse initiative projects that includes uh, whether or not they're in the core area, so that we're trying to fund um, the most beneficial conservation projects. And then the funding goes towards uh, cost share for the project that they're doing. If they don't get funded through us, we can still uh, work with them. We can either hold on to our application and try again next year, or provide uh, technical assistance, especially for people who don't uh, qualify for our programs. We can just provide technical assistance for whatever they're trying to work on. Um, we then require a range monitoring component um, as part of the contracting process that we have. So for the sage grouse initiative, one of the key things we work on and is required um, as part of our sage grouse initiative plan is a prescribed grazing plan. This involves, um, this is based on the range inventory that we had done on their place. Uh, we require that we allow adequate rest. Um, we would try and avoid grazing any pasture um, more than half of the growing season. And the length of that will vary depending on where you are. Uh, 45 days is where I am, so the whole season is 90 days. Um, we would usually say uh, take half of the forage and leave half of the forage. We do have some flexibility that someone wanted to do uh, a system where they graze the pasture heavier in one particular year. Uh, we would then require additional rest. We also uh, help develop a contingency plan for the ranch in the case of a drought or fire or some other natural disaster. And then uh, require annual range monitoring. Um, usually our grazing plans are for three years, and they get a payment um, per acre for doing that plan. And so we can also. Um, help put in uh, practices that would go along with that prescribed grazing. 
So for example, if someone wanted to uh, rest the pasture, but they didn't have water in the other pasture, we could help develop that. We also sometimes uh, use uh, like a water tank to move cattle away from sensitive wetland areas. We can do obstruction removal, like uh, removing fences that are causing problems. We can help with uh, weed management and um, reseeding if somebody had a small piece of cropland they wanted to put back to grass or something like that. In the West, a big um, uh, practice that NRCS has been involved with has been conifer removal. Um, since Sage Initiative has been implemented, the acres of conifer removal has skyrocketed there. And in Oregon, they've reduced the threat caused by uh, conifer encroachment to sage grouse by 68% across the whole state. Um, and efforts have been concentrated near current active lacks in order to get the most benefit for sage grouse rather than just um, doing conifer removal willy-nilly on the landscape. We also have the option to work on uh, easements. We have an agricultural land easement program. We work with partner groups like Land Trust or Nature Conservancy to develop these. And that uh, partner group is the one who holds the easement. And NRCS will pay up to 75% of that cost. An easement is a, a legal agreement where the landowner is being paid to transfer certain rights. So for example, the right to sod bust or the right to subdivide their land, that kind of thing. So that we know that uh, in perpetuity, that land will remain as it currently is. Um, and in uh, one of the particular successes of the sage grouse initiative has occurred in Idaho, where in uh, the Pioneer Mountain area, one third of that landscape has been put in easements through collaboration with the NRCS, uh, the Wood River Land Trust, and the Nature Conservancy, all working together to make sure that that land is always available for sage grouse habitat. We also have done quite a bit of work on fence marking and incorporate this into our plans. Um, fence collisions for sage grouse uh, often occur near Lex and on flat terrain. And so by marking the fences, we can reduce that risk of collision by uh, over 80%. And we have some mapping tools that allow us to see where there's most likely to be a problem. So we wouldn't necessarily, necessarily require someone to um, mark all of their fences, but just those high risk areas. So I mentioned earlier that, we're, um, that what we're doing is based on the best science we have available to us. So for example, um, with our grazing management plans, what we're trying to do is, besides increasing, improving range health, we're also trying to increase nesting cover uh, in areas that the birds are breeding based on their lek locations. So this one study found that a, a two inch increase in grass height could lead to an 8% increase in nest success and that um, that could then lead to an increase in population growth. So uh, that's why we have that goal of improving nesting cover. It's um, based on these scientific studies. We also, um, there's also been some research on fence collision risks and the effectiveness of fence markers in reducing them. Uh, and then we follow up what we're doing by communicating to the public and um, land managers about uh, the best practices and what's going on. So we have a science to solution series that takes some of that science, like the uh, research that has come out on fence marking, and puts it in an easy, readable format for uh, public or managers to have access to. We also communicate to the public about sustainable ranching and how it can benefit wildlife through um, our website, which is sagegrouseinitiative.com, um, our Facebook page, and other media. So there have been success stories 
in, for example, Beef Magazine, um, as well as in uh, local publications. And so um, I think that this helps uh, ranchers um, have a positive image with the public um, in a way that they might not otherwise um, have the opportunity to reach out to those groups. And so overall, um, regardless of whether the bird is listed or not, the Sagegrass Initiative has made a lot of progress in addressing uh, some of the threats that uh, other groups aren't able to. So we've worked on improved grazing systems on over 2 million acres. Um, we have almost half a million acres in conservation easements. We've removed uh, encroached conifers on 400,000 acres of land and marked or moved over 500 miles of high-risk fence, thereby avoiding a number of collisions. And at this point, uh, we've had over 1,100 ranchers uh, sign up and work with us. These numbers came out of a recent report um, put out a week or two ago by the NRCS detailing all the um, uh, progress that the Sage Grass Initiative has made so far, and also announcing that they're going to continue funding it through 2018, which is the length of the farm bill. And we're now uh, working on incorporating sage grouse needs into some of our other uh, programs that we have. And so this is just a map showing some of our grazing, seeding, and weed management projects. And so you can see how they're there's a number of them located um, all over the West, um, and especially in those dark green areas, which are our core areas. So that's what I have. And if anyone has any questions, I think Tara has been collecting those. And I'd love to answer any of them. That sounds good. Thanks, uh, Kelsey, for that excellent presentation so far. Um, there have been a few questions. Um, one of the first questions was, are there any core areas identified uh, for sage grouse in Canada? And I'm not sure if um, you're able to comment on that or not, but um, I thought I would, uh, would ask that, Kelsey. I guess not to my knowledge, because um, all these core areas have been delineated and, um, you know, like there's specific boundaries that we're using. So that would have to be something that someone in Kent, like someone in one of the provinces would have done. Right. Um, because, yeah, you guys would use your own criteria to, uh, to identify core areas in your jurisdiction um, right. versus Canada. OK. Sure, fair enough. Um, there was a question from Randy. Uh, does West Nile impact other growth species? That's a great question, and I'm not sure. I believe that it affects other bird species, but I don't really know. <laughs> All right. Um, sounds good. Um, there was a good point here made uh, in our chat um, that critical habitat for sage growth has been identified in Canada. So um, that is, is certainly, um, I guess it's not maybe the same language as what you guys use in, in your area, but um, you know, it might be comparable to core areas in the US, so for mm -hmm. sure. Um, another question uh, was uh, regarding predators. Um, there was a comment uh, or question regarding whether ravens are a more important predator than raptors. Um, so there's limited information because on, at least with uh, nest studies, the sample size tends to be fairly small. And so, you know, maybe you have 10 nests and um, so it doesn't really tell you who's doing all the predation. Um, we do know that ravens are particularly effective at um, uh, predating nests, that they'll watch the female sage grouse and wait for her to leave the nest and then go in, whereas a lot of other species are more uh, opportunistic and they just happen to cross the nest. So okay. I guess I don't have a, a great answer on that. We do know that. Um, Ravens will move into areas where there are landfills, um, and when they're at a certain um, density, they can cause almost complete nest failure. And I don't know that raptors um, often congregate at such densities that ravens will. 
Okay. Uh, well, thanks for that answer. Um, so anyway, I just also wanted to mention I've uh, just launched a poll. We have a couple polls that we're going to uh, ask for feedback for um, uh, on uh, on the uh, webinar today. And the first question is, um, is it useful to learn about sage roof conservation efforts in nearby jurisdictions? Um, so just as we're going through the rest of the questions, um, I just thought I would mention that we will be launching, uh, launching the poll. Um, and there's another question. Um, uh, and actually, also some feedback too, um, with regards to West Nile virus. That um, that one of the participants uh, figures that um, West Nile virus is affecting other growth species as well. So I'm not sure, but based on their experience, they must have found that out. Um, if the species is to be listed in the United States, how would this change the NRCS's sage growth initiative? Okay, so the NRCS has said that um, regardless of a listing, we will keep working on this initiative and we'll keep working with rancher, ranchers on um, managing their habitat to improve sage grouse habitat. It will probably get a lot more um, complicated and paperwork intense for us. Um, and I guess at this point no one's really sure what will happen if there's a listing, like what kind of um, regulations will be in place. So it's kind of um, an unknown for us. But We've definitely committed to continue working on this in whatever way we can. Okay. Because the, the issue isn't just about sage growth, really, it's about the sagebrush ecosystem. Right. Okay. Um, so there's also a question. Um, you referred to 40 uh, practices that are outlined for agriculture that can benefit sage growth. Uh, would you be willing to, to um, share a link to that, um, those practices? Yeah, I can send the conference report. If I email that to you, Terry, can you? Uh, sure, I think I can put in the link to the follow-up email to the webinar, and I can also post it on our YouTube uh, site as well, if that would work. OK, and, so, and some of those are, um, they're not necessarily practices that benefit, but that won't harm. Like, so you know, if we included um, a range planting, like we're planting a piece of crop under grass, Maybe there wouldn't be a direct benefit to sage grouse, but it wouldn't cause them any harm either. Okay. That sure. Sense. Those are up for interpretation, I guess. Um, okay. Um, we have another question. Um, Ashley wondered, how are the fences being marked? So that varies by state, but um, the NRCS has uh, standards and specifications at, in each state for all their practices. And so uh, in Montana, we've been doing um, just the top uh, fence line, um, and other states require two wires to be marked. Um, but we have, I can send out the specifications in Montana if anybody wants to see those for how we're doing it. Okay, sure. And I can include a link to, uh, to all the information that you send out for sure. I'm just going to launch the second poll here. Um, okay, we had another question. Uh, what are the parameters that you are using for vegetation restoration? Are you using native species, and is the restoration of sage included in any seeding? So um, in the Dakotas, they've done some plantings with sagebrush. Um, and there, I think that they've been using um, seedlings and not just putting in um, Sage brush seeds. That's okay, more so like plugs. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a few options for seedings. We have a, a range planting one. Um, and if I was working with someone on uh, sage grass habitat, I would probably encourage them to use a native mix. Um, and we require uh, a diversity of species in there, so we would require um, that there be some wildflower species in there as well. But because we do have some flexibility with this, we could, um, if somebody wanted to move something from cropland to grass, we could still allow them to use uh, introduced species, um, especially if they were then using um, that introduced grass to delay um, grazing on their native range and giving it additional rest. So it kind of depends on um, the producer and the what they're looking to do. Um, but it would always have to meet our uh, NRCS guidelines. 
as far as the species mix and feeding rates and things like that. Okay. Um, and just actually uh, for a bit of interesting uh, info, um, at PCAP's recent uh, prairie restoration workshop, uh, we did feature actually a, a restoration project uh, that was focused on sage growth habitat restoration. So um, I believe they use sage growth, or sorry, sage um, brush plugs as well. And that presentation is actually available on our website. So uh, following the question and answers here, I can just kind of quickly go through where you can find the, the presentation on our website if you are interested or any of our viewers are interested here. Um, so we've got another question. Um, regarding the conservation plans and the grazing days, is there a restriction on the timing of grazing, so related to a sensitive time for the growth? Well, um, so there's a little bit of, uh, well, with all our plans, the planner makes certain decisions. Um, so it's not necessarily set in stone that you can't graze a certain place at a certain time of year. Um, but what we do is then take those sage grouse um, needs into account. So we don't always know exactly where the birds are nesting, right? We're basing that based on their lek locations and so um, and based on our range inventory surveys that say, okay, this pasture is probably a uh, good nesting habitat. Uh, so I would, my biggest concern would be making sure that there was enough um, cover in that pasture, and that probably would involve uh, delaying grazing until later in the spring. Um, but if there was, if it was a really big pasture, say, and you had a pretty low stocking rate, then that would also be okay. So it would just depend on the, um, the particular ranch. I guess there's no, like, solid answer there, sorry. <laughs> No, that's fair enough. Um, I did just want to mention here, um, there's a, a function where people can raise their hand. Um, so if you are, if you do have your hand raised, um, maybe just type me a quick question so that um, I, can, I can answer or ask it uh, for Kelsey here. Um, so also, um, there's another question. Does the SGI have plans to delineate important habitat corridors between Montana and Alberta, Canada? Um, I don't know that for sure. There's ongoing research on the connectivity, they actually went to a great number of the leks across the West, but especially in Montana, um, and collected feathers to do uh, genetic studies to find out um, which sage grouse were moving from one area to another and how they were connected. I don't know if that included um, Alberta or not. Um, and they haven't released all that information yet, but once they do, um, I think we'll be able to use that as an additional um, way to focus our efforts. And because it's true that sometimes these core areas don't really allow you to know um, where the birds are going, say, in the winter, or where they're moving in between their nesting areas. Um, so I'd like to see that once we have that information available, that we'd be able to do something with it. Right. Um, yeah, and actually the, the last question I have here relates basically exactly to the earlier question. Um, aside from the connectivity earlier mentioned in core areas in Montana, um, is there any collaboration between the U.S. and Canada on sage growth initiatives? So um, that's quite similar to, uh, to the question earlier. Right. And um, to my knowledge, I think there has been some collaboration as far as research and stuff, but the, the sage growth initiative, you know, it's farm bill funding, so it's Funding-wise, you know, we just work with our the producers in the U.S. Um, I think it'd be great to see further collaboration in whatever way between people and conservation in the U.S. and Canada because um, you know populations are tied together. Yeah, definitely, um, and that's you know part of what we're we're hoping to achieve with this webinar too is just mm -hmm. um, you know providing some some audience members actually on both sides of the border. Um, we do have a diverse mix of uh, people participating in today's webinar. So uh, folks from, from the United States as well as from Canada representing a variety of sectors including ranchers and consultants um, and ENGOs and government, both federal and provincial. So um, yeah, part of what we're doing here is just to, to try and share information, I guess, um, uh, amongst one, another group, one, um, one another's uh, jurisdictions here. 
Um, so we do have a few more, um, okay, a few more questions. Um, does the Sage Growth Initiative have a science-based position related to wind energy development plans? So for example, do they have any no-go zones and zones with appropriate mitigation? So um, things like energy development generally get um, dealt with through the state plans, which have, um, well, like for example, the Montana and Wyoming ones say you can't have any disturbance within, um, or surface disturbance within a kilometer of less, and then um, on the landscape level that there would only be 5% surface disturbance. So that's not something we really address is the energy development aspect of what's going on, especially because a lot of that is either um, on federal lands or has to go through uh, like federal or state permitting. Um, we don't see really landowners coming in and wanting to do that. So it's just not something that we really had to handle. OK, sure. Um, Sorry, I'm just going to, uh, there's quite a bit of comment here, so I'm just trying to moderate um, where we are. Uh, hmm. uh, there was a comment about there is an MOU uh, between, um, shoot, I just kind of lost it here. There is an MOU um, between, um, I believe it was uh, Montana as well as uh, the government of Saskatchewan through the northern steppe. I'm just trying to pull everything up here. Unfortunately, it's not all coming up here. Um, the Northern Step Initiative, I believe. So, um, and that was signed by government agencies under WAFWA. So, um, my apologies if I have that wrong. I only just have the bottom couple uh, sentences there. But um, so it does sound like there is a memorandum of understanding between a variety of government organizations. So, um, on some level, there's some collaboration. Okay, the Northern Sagebrush Step Initiative. Thanks, Joel. All right. Um, there was a question also um, from Jarrett. Um, sorry if I missed this, but now have, or sorry, how have populations of sage grouse responded to these initiatives? Um, that's kind of a tough one to answer because we don't always have a way to follow up on what we're doing. Like we're, you know, monitoring the, um, we're doing range monitoring and seeing how the plants are changing. But there's also so many other things going on, like weather, that it can be hard to tie in our specific actions. Um, there is an ongoing study in Roundup, Montana, looking at um, ranches that have one of our um, SGI plans in place and ranches that don't, and comparing them. And at this point, the um, results, as far as uh, nesting success, have been uh, inconclusive. It's still ongoing. Uh, but they did find that in the um, the SGI ranches there was higher nesting cover. Um, I was going to make another point. What was it? Oh, and all the um, state agencies have some form of monitoring, so we can see general trends um, in what's going on. But because you know, it's not like there's one county that's all sage grass and ship and one county that's not. So because the birds are maybe using different landowners, some of whom are using this and some of whom are not, it's really hard to um, conclusively say that, you know, what we did increase the population by this many birds. All right. Um, well, I'll give everyone a couple more minutes for any additional questions. Um, maybe if it's okay with you, Kelsey, I'll just um, switch over to become the presenter and I can go through um, where to access our YouTube channel on our website. Sure. Okay, sure. Um, all right. Oh, okay, there's one more question. Um, are there any initiatives aimed at removing structures off the landscape that would aid predators, such as nest trees for raptors, relocating power lines, or removing buildings? Um, yes, there are. We, so um, NRCS can do some of that. We have a practice called obstruction removal. So we can remove like um, fences, brush piles, um, old buildings and structures that are problematic. Um, one thing we have to be careful about is that if um, if something is more than 50 years old, like if it's an old homestead, then it's considered um, a cultural resource. And as a federal agency, 
uh, there's a lot of restrictions and we can't necessarily remove that or you know put funding in to remove that. Um, some of the uh, state plans encourage, um, for example, putting power lines underground. Um, and also some of the, uh, I mentioned that CCAA conservation, um, candidate conservation agreement with assurances. And so one of their conservation measures is um, moving uh, tall structures um, and removing them or making them shorter, putting power lines underground. There are other funding sources besides SGI. If somebody wanted to do something that they couldn't do with us, um, our state uh, has an upland um, game bird program, and they um, help fund producers as well. The Fish and Wildlife Service has a private lands program, and they also provide funding. Uh, so if it was some sort of obstruction removal that we weren't able to do, they could uh, go through one of those other funding avenues. But we do um, do some of those. All right. Um, I did just want to mention again, if you have your hand raised um, on the webinar function, please just send me a quick question and I'll be happy to, uh, to answer your questions. Um, so this presentation will be posted on our YouTube channel at the end of uh, the workshop here, um, so, or at the end of the webinar rather, um, at the very bottom of our website, so that's www.pcap-sk.org. Um, we've got some uh, widgets here, so you can link up with our Facebook page, our Twitter account, as well as our YouTube. So if you just click on our YouTube uh, link there, then you will um, uh, be uh, redirected to our, our YouTube page. I also uh, indicated that we had recently had a presentation uh, related to sage grouse restoration. Uh, so if you go to our website again, resources and literature, um, go down to NPRW presentations from 2015. Um, and we should have on the second day, I believe, uh, Brad Downey's presentation from the Alberta Conservation Association, uh, Silver Sage, Sage Conservation Sites, it's presentation 17. So if anyone is interested in checking that out. All right, a um, couple more questions. Um, OK. Uh, what is the approximate budget for the NRCS initiative in Montana? Um, I'm not sure um, how much in Montana, especially because um, some of the sage grouse initiative funding, especially for the partner positions, comes from other places. They did announce that for um, that they're committing $198 million through 2018 for the sage grouse initiative, NRCSs. Um, and so that would be over the next uh, three years and over those 11 states. So I don't think at this point that they know um, how much money will get will go to each state. For sure. OK. Um, and Kelsey did mention, too, that we can share her contact information. So um, maybe uh, in the follow-up email uh, following our webinar, um, I'll just include that with, uh, with the other information, the links as well. So if you have any further questions or want to discuss things a bit more in depth with her, um, then you have an opportunity to. Um, so of the two polls that we conducted earlier, um, the first one was asking if it's worthwhile learning about uh, sage grouse conservation in other jurisdictions. Um, of all the respondents, 100% of the people felt that yes, it was worthwhile. Um, and the second poll we had um, asked whether um, people would be interested in learning about other uh, species at risk conservation initiatives um, you know, for other species not just sage grouse, um, across other jurisdictions. And 97% of the respondents said that, yes, they would be interested in that. Um, so um, I did have a couple other points I was going to make. OK, um, we will, um, I think tomorrow, I believe, you'll be receiving just a follow the email with the links um, as to where you can find everything. And also uh, a brief survey. So it's like three questions long. It's very, very short. I believe they're all yes or no. Um, and if you could please just fill them out, that would really help us with, um, with future events, future webinars, um, and also help us uh, just to keep track of who, who participated and, and just help us plan out some other, um, other uh, future work that we're doing. OK. Um, there's a question about how many participants um, are part of the Sage Growth Initiative and what proportion they would be um, American versus Canadian. So um, I'll let 
Kelsey answered the number of participants maybe from the American standpoint, but because this is an American program, uh, Canadian uh, branches aren't able to participate in, in this program as such. Um, so the question is how many participants there have been in the program? And um, um, was that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think it's been 1,179. The number I put on my slide was over 1,100, but I, uh, I think that's the number. Um, and uh, that doesn't include people that I think who have just come in and um, had applications but haven't had that follow up. So there, there's, I think there's opportunity for more um, landowners to get involved. And those are all um, landowners and not, uh, that doesn't include like our partners or anything. Right, okay. So yeah, that's quite an ambitious number of people to be involved with the program. And I just wanted to mention too, actually, that the NRCS has some other um, species of interest that we work with that are uh, candidate species or um, things like that. And so there's actually a lesser prairie chicken initiative as well. Um, and we have a few other species that we incorporate into our working lands for wildlife plans. Um, but sage grouse initiative is definitely the most uh, developed uh, of these programs. All right. Sounds good. Well, I think um, we're going to probably wrap it up here, um, unless anyone has any burning questions left unanswered. But um, like I said, I'll include Kelsey's uh, contact information so we can um, we can share that um, in the follow-up email. Um, Okay, and uh, yeah, just again, um, we had uh, 73 people registered for the webinar. Um, not everybody that registered actually participated, but we had, I think, well over 60 people that were on the call today. So um, I thank everyone for all your time uh, coming out. And again, I'd just like to, uh, to thank um, or to give credit for the in-kind support for this speaker series, which is provided by the Montana Association of Conservation Districts and the Sage Gross Initiative. And also just once again mention that this project was undertaken with the financial support of the Government of Canada through the Federal Department of the Environment. So did you have anything left that you wanted to add, Kelsey? Uh, no, but thanks everyone for attending and it's nice to see that there's uh, so much interest in this. Yeah, well, yeah, very much so. Thank you so much for your presentation and uh, yeah, we learned a lot. So we will sign out then now. Thanks everybody. Bye.